And for the first mission trip in my life, I didn't get on the plane, but it all makes sense because the next day the corona hit. And I would have been stuck in the Middle East in Dakar. And I may have been 30 days before they would allow me back in the country. The crusade never happened. So they were just hearing, it's not no, it's not now. So here's where it gets crazy. And I just say this in love because, you know, I roll with a lot of different people. They say, if you're a black preacher, you preach good when you're happy. And it's true. You're at a family reunion. Some of my brother friends and man, the food's good and the fellowship's good. They will preach the pain off the walls. A white guy preaches good. You step on his toe, you steal his car. Okay, Satan, you're going to pay. And then he preaches the pain off the wall. So one preaches good when he's happy. The other preaches when he's mad. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's just culture. But here's the thing. When I had 10 countries lined up, I was willing to die in Pakistan. The Lord is clear as I'm speaking to you. The Holy Spirit said, Frank, you've been in my army for 40 years. You remember that song we sang at VBS? I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir, I'm in the Lord's army. You remember that song? Well, I've been in the Lord's army. My dad was army in Vietnam. My granddaddy was Navy. I got a cousin in the Coast Guard and I got another cousin today in the Marines. And they would say, well, what are you in? I'm like, well, I'm in the Lord's army. But they, that never impressed anybody. Are you with me? <laughs> but I'm a general for God. I'm a lieutenant for the Lord. I'm a captain for Christ. I'm an officer for the... Okay, I'm going to preach. But the bottom line is... The Lord said, you've been in my army, but in these days, I need you to get in the Air Force. And you say, Frank, what does that mean? Sometimes you got to go over the enemy's head. And the Lord gave me something. And now this is where I'm just going to cast the vision to you. I felt like the Lord said, use radio, use TV, use Facebook Live, use whatever it takes to go over the enemy's head and share the gospel. And so here's where the Lord opened up. I know a preacher in Florida who spends $40,000 a month to be on television. Now that's DirecTV, Dish Network, Daystar TV, TBN. When you see Joel, Jeremiah, Jakes, Joyce, Jensen, Jesus, man, there's a lot of J's in the ministry. Are you with me? But if you think it's cheap to be on TV, it's not. It's expensive. And I'm just going to share this in love. If you don't think Facebook one day is going to kick all the Christians off, You've been smoking some bad weed. I'm just being real. One day, the CEO of Twitter recently said, if you say anything that goes against the CDC guidelines or the World Health Organization, they didn't say you would be banned. Quote, you would be banned for life and lose your social media platform. So when I get these pastors bragging, well, we got more people watching now from their home in pajamas than they're coming to church. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves in the last day. See, we were made for intimacy. Jesus, enemy, Satan wired you for isolation. One is promoting faith. The other is promoting fear. One's promoting heaven. The other is promoting hell. One's promoting guilt. One's promoting grace. Are you with me? And we do got to be saved. But more importantly, we got to preach Jesus saves. Now's not the time in the ministry to take our foot off the gas. We need to put the pedal to the metal. Amen. So here's the thing. One guy's paying 10 grand a week. I know one pastor praying 40,000 a month. And that ain't an ego trip. It's a missions trip because he that wins souls is wise. But I just believe this is from the Lord. Your church has always been on the cutting edge. Your church is always thinking out of the box. I love your church because you're not only teaching truth, you're reaching people. Your church, don't ever want to say, oh, we go to a small church. You guys are doing a big thing more than some big, big churches are doing. Because you got a heart for souls, you got a heart for purity, you got a heart for Jesus. So here's where God put something in my lap. The month after the corona hit at home, and I'm thinking, okay, God, I want to be used by you more than ever. TBN from California called me at my house in Maryland, and they said, would you be willing to co-produce a show from your house in Maryland? I could have easily preached it. I'm an evangelist. I live by faith. And the Lord said, no, give it away. So I produced this show. We got a guy from American Idol, someone from Skillet. Maybe you've ever heard of Skillet. The lead singer of Skillet, John, was our guy. Tony Nolan, I handpicked him, the to tour pastor to Casting Crowns. And I had 18 youth pastors get up and do a shout out. It went all over the country. And I didn't even have my face or my name at all in that hour program. The Lord said, give it away. I believe the doors you open for others, God will open for you. So here's the crazy thing. After that happened, the Lord opened the door that um, 
what should be $100,000 easy a year to be on TV. The Lord worked it out. We're now, we just signed a contract. We stepped out by faith. But if you mailed a letter to 200 million homes, one letter, 200 million homes, with a 50 cent stamp, 200 million homes, it would cost $100 million to get a one page letter that says, God loves you. And most people would look at it and throw it in the trash. It would cost $100 million to mail one letter to 200 million homes. But the Lord just opened up a door. Talk about favor. Because show me your faith and God will show you his favor. Amen. Favor comes after faith even in the dictionary. Flavor, Bascom Robbins, 39 flavors. Flavor is a taste made by man, but favor is a touch from God. I had a church telling me, how are you doing it? How are you doing it? I said, man, I'm still just trusting Jesus. They said, how's your method? I said, it's the Bible. So like, what's the model? I said, it's God. No, they like, seriously. And I said, can I be honest with you? And he was mad. I said, sir, the difference between you and me is you're relying on your finances. I'm still relying on my faith. And I said, you may outfinance me, but you won't outfaith me. That's what I told a pastor of a large church. I said, you started out relying on your Savior, but somehow you slipped into relying in your savings. And unless you can write a check for it, you ain't going to trust God for it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you remember when they brought the four? The four friends had a paralytic friend who was physically handicapped, and they couldn't get in the front door because the church was packed. And desperate people do desperate things. They went out on the roof to bring them to Jesus. Sometimes you've got to go over the enemy's head. And number two, friends don't let friends die without meeting Jesus. And you talk about ripping the roof off. They, Zacchaeus went out on a limb. These guys went out on the roof. They were on top of things. That old Motown song, up on the roof. Are you with me? They went out on the roof and they ripped the roof off. They were like your praise team. They rock for the rock and they ripped the roof off. Are you with me? Now here's the thing. What's on every roof in America? Shingles, praise the Lord. I thought you said Pringles because I'm hungry. Amen. <laughs> Amen, sister. But no, watch this. At least every other home around here, it's a satellite dish. It's either direct TV or dish. And the Lord gave me this. Are you ready for this? Not mailing one letter to 200 million that would cost 100 million dollars. I ain't even got that much money in Monopoly money. The Lord opened it up that we could be for $25,000, not for a week, not for a month, for a year, not to mail one time. We stepped out by faith. Our TV show now is aired to 200 million homes, four days a week, on four networks in four continents. We're in America, Europe, Africa, and Pakistan, the place I didn't even get to preach. Now watch this, for $25,000 doesn't go to me. We're a nonprofit. It will help me and not preach one letter. It's a 30 minute show. They will air it four times a week on four networks and four continents times 52 weeks for 20. Now, here's another way to look at it. If you had a chance today to buy one hundred million dollar house and someone was going to sell it to you for twenty five thousand dollars, raise your hand if you think that's a good price. Amen. Since your right hand is still up, repeat after me. I'm now deputized to evangelize. So by going over the roof and getting people to Jesus, I can't be in four continents at the same time. And whether the church is running 10 or 10,000, 200 million homes is still a pretty unique opportunity. So you know what? There's a church on the eastern shore last month running 75 and they took a love offering and raised $7,800 to go towards the $25,000 thing. I, this wasn't in the sermon. I just want to give you a thought. What about if between now and January 1st, if your church would pray about raising $5,000 by January 1st as a mission to be in God's Air Force? Because you know what? Like God could come really, really soon. And if they shut Facebook down, if the governors of a state finally say you can never come to church unless you're willing to go to prison, they may shut me down on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. But for the moment, we can still be on TV all around the world. And it's not an ego thing. Let's face it. Every preacher on TV ain't even preaching the gospel. 
And if you sit and watch 30 minutes, they're either trying to sell you something or two, they may not even give an invitation to how you on the couch can get saved today. And one of the reasons I think God has used me, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but we always give an invitation. If you die today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? So I, I give you my word. That's what we'll do. And, and just pray. It's tax deductible. You can go to frankshelton.com. You would write Frank Shelton Global. It does not go to me. But that would help us with that contract because the show's called By Faith. And we stepped out by faith. But God uses the local church to bless his international gospel. And if you just feel led to be part, you may be a businessman, maybe your Sunday school class, you all may just say in the next 90 days, maybe we're just going to try to aim towards 5,000 and put, and, and then if it, does, if it ain't for you, it's okay. But that would be so cool if North Glen Church would actually be part of that. That would be amazing. And when I tape more shows, I would be honored for Pastor Paul to sit on the couch like Oprah and let that brother brag on Jesus. So give God a round of applause that I'm going to preach. Amen. I heard a story real quick. This pastor got up and, uh, man, he was preaching on sin. And uh, he was getting at it, getting at it. He goes, man, I go to my brother's house and open up the closet and all it is is a bunch of liquor. And he goes, man, I hate liquor. I hate alcohol. I hate beer. I hate wine. And he said, I got in the truck, went down to the river, and I dumped it all in the river. And then he goes, I went to my sister's house. And I'm not trying to call people out. And it was filled to the gills with beer and Budweiser and Coors. And he said, I got frustrated. And she had more beer than my brother. I put it all in the back of the truck. I drove down to the river and dumped it all in the river. Then I went to a family reunion. Couldn't believe it. We got my entire family drinking Coors and Michelob and Budweiser. And I got frustrated. And it was a holy anger. And I wasn't trying to be religious. Wasn't trying to make a scene. But I dumped it all in two trucks. Went down to the lake. Dumped it in the river. He preached for 30 minutes. Sin after sin after sin. Then when he finally caught his breath and sat down, the 70-year-old choir director said, For our closing hymn, turn to 365, we'll gather at the river. Amen. <laughs> Some of you will get it tomorrow, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Father, we need you today. Jesus is the rock. And when we know the rock, we can drop our rocks. And we don't have to throw rocks. Father, I pray that we wouldn't be so busy looking at the sins of our neighbor. Just looking in the mirror will convict us ourselves. I pray that we would look up to remember how holy you are. And with the magnifying glass of the Holy Spirit, we would look in to see where we need some home improvement. And if we spend the rest of our days loving God and loving others, we won't have time to throw rocks ever again. Oh, God, touch the heart of every person today. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. God is good, amen? God is good. So here's the message today. Don't throw rocks. John chapter 8, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. I'm not wearing my glasses. I thought it said he went to Olive Garden. I am hungry, amen? <laughs> and early in the morning, say early, he came to the temple, say temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Do you know what? Studying for this message, 132 times Jesus is mentioned in the New Testament. This floored even the preacher. Do you know only 10 times of the 132 times that Jesus is mentioned in the New Testament that he was actually in the church? 132 times he's mentioned outside, only 10 times he's in the house of God. Jesus had a marketplace ministry. And I don't know who this is for, but the best Christians are not the ones who were paid or professional or on some platform. Some of the greatest ministers and ministries is just shining a light Monday through Friday. And if you ever don't think that God isn't using you, he's using you more than you know. Some of us preach, some of us teach, but we all can reach. Amen. But this is one of the times that the saviors have in church. Verse 3, John 8, And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they threw her in his midst. Now, this is the Savior on a Sunday having a sermon, and they turned it into Jerry Springer. Can I get an amen? amen. He was having church. They wanted to have court. He was preaching a sermon, and they're trying to have a scandal. 
and he is preaching and the back of the door is open and they bring in a woman who's caught in the very act. Let me park the car here. For 2,000 years, we found the woman, but no one has yet told me who the man was. Can I be real? What you accuse others is usually where you're guilty. I learned in third grade, be careful to point the finger because you got three or four coming back at you. And if you're trying to expose someone else, you either don't know the grace of God or you've been saved and you no longer act like God because you're actually acting more like the devil than the Lord himself. It got quiet, but this is good preaching. Can I get an amen? amen. Do you know why they don't know who the man is? Some people believe it was a Pharisee who himself was caught in bed with her. And when they, I believe she was set up. Remember Mary and Barry said the beat set me up. Are you with me? The crazy thing is, I believe it was the religious that set her up. And let's, because she was caught in the very act. And here's the catch. It takes two to tango, but watch this. If they caught her in the very act, their eyes were on something that they shouldn't have been seeing. If they had binoculars looking at her in an intimate state, that was just modern day pornography back in the day. But in real time, are you with me? And so she's in bed with someone else. And I know we're in the house of God. I'm not going to get descriptive, but I say this respectfully. She wasn't even wearing as much as Victoria's Secret models were wearing. She's not at the beach. She ain't in a bikini. She just got caught in bed. And she's not in her Sunday best. She's in her Sunday worst. And they don't summons her to court. They're summoning her to church. And watch this. I'm not trying to drop names, but one night, Meadowlark Lemon asked me to meet him in St. Louis. And the Harlem Globetrotter, his wife called me and said, will you be my husband's date at a banquet? I say this in love. I'm not gay, but when she said date, I said, I'm on the next flight. <laughs> Basketball Hall of Famer. Wife calls me, will I be with Meadowlark Lemon at a dinner table? And at that dinner, Paul, was a guy named Albert Pujols, who's right now the top five all-time home run hitter for Major League Baseball. Sitting next to him was a guy that just died two weeks ago named Lou Brock, African-American baseball player. Next to him was Don Mattingly from the New York Yankees, Mr. Baseball. And who rolled up in a wheelchair was Stan the Man Musial, 91 years old. And it's me, Forrest Gump, sitting next to Meadowlark Lemon. They said the night before, Meadowlark, when he had... When Albert Pujols had won the World Series in 2011 for the Cardinals, he had just signed a contract for $253 million to go play for the Anaheim Angels. Not one person on ESPN said he's in it for the money. $253 million. I'm asking you in 90 days to pray about $5,000. There's always someone that, oh, he's in it for the money. Are you with me? $253 million to swing a bat, but at least he swings for Jesus. He's a Christian. And he's trying to make more money to give it away to the Dominican Republic where he came from. He buys hundreds and hundreds of beds to bless the people where he came from. So at least he just ain't putting it in his pocket. He's using it for his glory. I love the verse, whatever your hand finds to do, do it for his glory. Amen? Now here's the thing. Can you imagine if I stood up with Albert at the table, the guy from the Yankees, the Harlem Globetrotters, Stan the Man Musial, <clears throat> the least at the table. Excuse me, Albert, it's good to be here. Don't mean to embarrass you, Meadowlark. But you're pretty good with the bat. You just hit one 553 feet. Can I tell you how to swing the bat better? I'd be an idiot. Can you imagine Tiger Woods is a first-time guest next week, and he comes in, and all of a sudden the guy had a green jacket from a couple masters, and yeah, he had a few hiccups in the road, but I have too. We've all dropped the ball. Are you with me? And I pray that if he came in, and I know you all would, but not every church would, you don't bring up his past. You tell him about his future that he can have with Jesus. But you tell the guy with the green jacket, hey, you're pretty good with the four iron. You're pretty good with the three wood. You're pretty good with the putter. But Tiger, let me tell you how to play the game of golf. You'd be an idiot. The Pharisees, they didn't interrupt Billy Graham's sermon. They didn't interrupt Spurgeon's sermon. They didn't interrupt Charles Stanley's sermon. They didn't interrupt Pastor Paul's sermon. They didn't interrupt Tozer's sermon. They didn't interrupt Moody's sermon. They didn't interrupt Billy Graham's sermon. They interrupted God having church. And he's preaching and he's teaching, but now he's going to do some reaching. 
And in the middle of the sermon, bam, here comes the doors. And they bring in a woman in her most vulnerable position. And he's all about church and they're all about court. And they got steam in their ears, veins in their neck, and their face is redder than a Ferrari. And they have the audacity to embarrass a woman. But watch this. They were using her to get to him. They called her in the alt of adultery, verse 4, and they said, Master, this woman was called the very act. Now Moses in the Old Testament says that she be stoned. But what do you say, Jesus? Watch this. They had the audacity to quote the Old Testament, Moses, but they took for granted the New Testament standing before them. They're talking about the law, and the Lord is all about love. Say love. Then they said, tempting him. That is crazy. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what is sad, you see, is they looked religious on the outside, but they were dead on the inside. They looked clean to the world, but they were dirty to the Lord. Man, I'm going to get the tape. This sounds pretty good. Amen. God is on this message. Watch this. And they were using her, verse 6, tempting him that they may accuse him. The people dressed religious were trying to accuse the sinless son. These aren't my words. It's all right in front of our eyes. So Jesus went from standing to stooping and with his finger wrote on the ground as he heard them not. Look to your neighbor and say, sometimes you got to tune out your critics. So when they continued asking him, he said, he that was without sin can throw the first stone at her. Say stone. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it being convicted of their own conscience, they left one by one and dropped the rocks from the oldest to the youngest. And Jesus was left all alone with just the woman and her. Jesus then stood up and saw no one but her. And he said, woman, where are your accusers? Does no one condemn thee? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said, here's grace. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So he's having church. They want court. But what they fail to realize, whether they're having court or whether they're having church, Jesus is judge in both camps. You know, I find it easy and interesting that Jesus had all day for prostitutes. Not that he was doing anything inappropriate. He had all day for prostitutes. He had zero time for Pharisees. Pharisees were like kit cars. They were all show, but they were no go. They paraded like a Ferrari and you get up under the hood. It's just a Fiero. One will beat a Porsche. The other one's just a Pontiac Fiero. They may look like it, but under the hood, all show, no go. They looked like they were going to heaven, but they were going straight to hell. And they were religious. You know, most people will go to hell and miss heaven by 12 inches. They had them here, but they never had them here. A foot. See, the religious had the rhetoric, and they had the routine. And they even had the robes, but they didn't have a real relationship with God. You know, there's people who may be in church more than you and I, and still split hell wide open. You could have perfect attendance. You can go to church three times a week and still miss Jesus. Are you with me? I'm telling you this. If you spend the rest of your life just loving God and loving others, that will keep you busy. But the people on Facebook and trying to destroy people and throw rocks in life and trying to constantly start trouble and maybe get a lawsuit around every corner, if you thrive on that, you're acting more like the enemy than the Lord. Are you with me? So they're having court, he's having church, and see, Jesus said, flip a table once, and he said, I'm going to flip the table again, and he goes from standing to stooping, and watch this, as a kid, I used to wear Air Jordans, lately, I've been wearing Air Jesus, the flip-flop sandals, <laughs> the Bible says, blessed are the feet who bring the gospel, and those flip-flop sandals that you would see in Israel, there was a concrete marble floor back in the day in the synagogue, and when they would walk in, there was a dirt dust that would actually come over top of the concrete. So if you're at the beach 
you can write in the sand, but picture back in the temples of that day, because of the dirt and dust that came under the feet of the sandals, it would cover the floor and Jesus could actually write on the floor and you could make out what he was saying. Now, one guy had a rock about this big, not real big, but you remember when David took out Goliath, he had how many smooth stones? Five. I used to think in case he was a little nervous, he was young, in case he had bad aim, he still had four other chances to knock him out. I mean, is, is that how you thought? That's how I thought. You know what I've learned over the years? No, no, true story, Goliath had four other brothers. And if they came to town, he was Rambo before Rambo. We're gonna take them all out. <laughs> that ain't arrogant, it's confidence. Arrogance is I'm gonna do it, confidence is God's gonna do it. Frank, how dare you ask for five grand in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 100, no. I'm not begging you, I'm just casting a vision. You wanna be in the Air Force? You join with me, you don't gotta do physical training. Can I get an amen? <laughs> But watch this, watch this, watch this. One, but a small enough stone could still do a lot of damage. It could kill somebody. Then they got one Pharisee, he got a softball size, and you could get a hold of that. That could do some damage too. One guy comes in here with a bowling ball. It seems like the bigger the sin, the bigger the rocks they would have had. And they're more cocky, they're arrogant. They got chips on both shoulders. So one got a stone, one got a baseball, one got a softball, one guy got a bowling ball, and one guy comes in here with a boulder and he's the meanest in the bunch. And Jesus doesn't say a word because sometimes the greatest sermons is saying nothing but just living it loud. And he doesn't say a word and he goes from standing to stooping and I believe, and they thought we got him, we got him, we got him because see in their mind they already had her but in their mind they're so sick they thought they had him. And Jesus was getting ready to go to school. Doesn't say a word, he gets on the ground, they all hover around him. We got him, we got him, we got him. You can't put God in the corner. You can't even put him in a grave because he always comes out. And watch as he gets down and I believe he wrote the word $19.42. Now that means nothing to you. It meant nothing to 99% of the people that they disrupted. It meant nothing to most of the Pharisees except for this one guy who's cocky and thought he had him. And when they saw that, his eyes got bigger than the offering plate and bam, he dropped his rock because without saying a word, Jesus said, you're the treasure of this whole thing. You got some issues in your own life. And when he wrote $19 and change, Jesus said, that's basically what I know you stole from the temple treasury about 32 days before. So you keep your mouth shut and bam, his rock dropped. <laughs> then he got back down again and I believe he wrote the word, uh, Liz, uh, Beth. Didn't say a word, it means nothing to you meant nothing but the guy, the real cocky one with the big rock, the one he knew he had Jesus, he wrote Elizabeth and his eyes got even bigger, his mouth dropped and bam, he got arthritis, dropped it on his foot. He had to call a tow truck. Can I get an amen? He was the rolling stones, praise the Lord. And he probably said, you've been sleeping with a woman and it ain't your wife and her name is Elizabeth, case closed. And he went down the line, bam, 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 bam. Bam, they liked Rocky. Hey, yo, it's me. <laughs> All these rocks are on the ground. And one by one, they left. And at that moment, it's just Jesus and her. Now here's leadership, but here's the Lord, but here's love. True leadership doesn't put out on Facebook and call everybody sin. True leadership in love, the Bible says if you have something wrong with your brother or sister, go in private with another and restore them if possible. Too many of us are gone public when we should have went in private and go through prayer. So when they left, technically then Jesus could have put his hands on his hip and throw lightning at her because all the accusers gone and he is perfect. But actually he didn't throw lightning, he threw love. He didn't throw guilt, he gave grace. And I've learned grace has a face and his name is Jesus. And when the religious walked out, the world walked up. And through blurry visions, have you ever heard of that old expression, I was caught red-handed? You know, maybe you stole a cookie and your grandmother walked in when you were eight. Maybe you stole a bike when you were 13. Maybe you were looking at Chucky's homework and you got caught in the act. She was caught red-handed. And I believe she saw a bullseye on Jesus' hand. And the interesting thing is because when he went down to reach her and her through blurry, blurry vision, I was told never look down on someone 
unless you're trying to help them back up. You know, women will get this. Y'all like to shop. And I, we like this thing called a discount. We're all trying to get the discount. Yeah, that shirt was 63 bucks and it was down half price and then they knocked another half off and I had two coupons. The next thing, I got a $63 shirt for $4.99. You got a discount. Here's the thing. Be careful who you discount because Jesus paid full price. So this woman caught in the very act and I'm just going to be real. I remember years ago, Pastor Paul, they asked President Carter, well, you've never committed adultery, have you? And he said, to be honest, and he teaches Sunday school. He goes... I have. And they said, what? And you don't ever want a president to go on TV talking about affairs, unless it's current affairs or national affairs or foreign affairs. <laughs> and he said, no, I've read the Bible. And Jesus said, if I thought about a woman with lust, I guess I'm as guilty as doing it. He confessed. He still became president. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all righteousness. But if we parade ourselves like we're perfect and we've never dropped the ball, doomsday's coming. You know, we're all going to be caught. You're either going to be caught by the religious or you're going to be caught by the Redeemer. You're going to be caught by the ones who pretend to be perfect and they will make you go through hell. Or you can be caught by the one who is perfect and he may give you a lot of heaven if you just ask. It's better to be caught doing wrong with Jesus than caught doing wrong with everybody else. And with blurry vision, she looks up and here's where it's good. And, and, and I'm not going to elaborate, but at this moment... She's not looking in the eyes of Hollywood star. She's looking in the eyes of heaven's son. She's not looking at Denzel. She's looking at the divine. She's not looking at a president. She's looking at the prince of peace. And she's not looking at someone who is good. She's looking at the only one who's ever been God. And watch this. If anyone could have thrown a rock, the rock of ages chose not to. The Savior didn't even sling a stone and the Prince of Peace didn't even pluck the pebble because religion is heavy and hard. But grace is light and love. And the next time you're tempted to throw rocks, maybe we should remember the rock who chose not to. I'll leave you with this. So he went from standing to stooping to saving. And they tell me that when it was just the two of them, just the two of us. <laughs> you can make it. Are you with me? They say that when Jesus left her, when Jesus left her, they said he left the temple and they tell me he was walking straight towards Calvary's cross. The reason he could let her off the hook is because he would get up the tree to pay for her, to pay for you, to pay for the world, and even me. And we're getting to heaven, not because we were so good, but because he is so God. You've heard of so raven. Jesus is so God. And I really think when we realize how pure he is, and when we take an honest inventory, how impure at times we can be, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? But when you look up and see how pure he is, and if we confess how impure we are, then we can love others because we've been forgiven. The people who are angry with everyone else are still mad at themselves. Or they're mad at someone that failed them. And sometimes we blame the church for something Jesus didn't even do. I mean, let's face it, there have been stories of pastors who've slept with someone in the church, and it is horrendous. But we don't blame Jesus the rest of our life and Borkite going to church thinking they're all a bunch of hypocrites. You know, one teacher that sleeps with someone doesn't mean the entire board of education is bad. And there are some cops that have done some stupid, stupid stuff. But some of the ones that I know would still jump in front of a bullet for you, whether you like them or not. And we got to stop blaming Jesus for something Jesus didn't even do. Religion has messed it up, but a relationship will patch it up. Amen? I want to talk to you about being unhinged, and I'm done in three minutes. I've shared this story, but I'm going to share it again. I'm sitting at the Charlotte airport a year ago at the American Airlines gate, Charlotte Douglas Airport, 
and I'm minding my own business. And it's gate 34. I got a 50 minute flight to Washington and I'm sitting here. And if I've ever heard the voice of God at that time, he still speaks. We got to listen. And I'm sitting there. It's packed. Wall to wall people, American Airlines and this African-American ladies come to me and the Lord said, get up and give your seat. And I'm like, Lord, I'm tired. I just did five days with the Billy Graham Association and Charlotte staff training. Five, 14 hours a day in a hotel. It looks glamorous. It's not. Dead tired. Just trying to fly home to be with my own wife and kids. And I'm just sitting down. And the second time, the Holy Spirit said, give her your seat. I got the angel on one shoulder and the little red pitchfork cartoon on the other. I'm just being real. Has that, do you know where I'm at? This guy's running his mouth. It's usually Satan running his mouth. Even Jesus said, you got to tune out the critics. You got to tune into Christ, but tune out the critics. And it hit this guy saying, we did the Rosa Park thing like 50 years ago. You don't got to give up your seat. And the Lord said, get up and give her your seat. And then he's running his mouth. All this is like in with like six seconds because she's coming closer, closer. And sometimes God will stop speaking to you and you missed it. And I'm not trying to do the right thing because I'm a preacher. I'm just trying to do it because I'm a child of God. Someone asked me on a radio show not long ago, do you want to be known as a great preacher or a good Christian? I said, I just want to be remembered as a good Christian. Why would you say that? I said, can I be honest? I could show you some great preachers who aren't even good Christians. It's become an entertainment. You, you know, pull the string, make us laugh, make us smile, say this. They looked it on the outside, got under the hood. Oh God, they needed prayer too. We all need prayer. The Holy Spirit said, get up third time, give your seat. And I looked at her and Satan was like, well, you're gonna make us all look bad. It ain't about making anyone look bad. Sometimes you gotta be a good example than a poor excuse. And I said, ma'am, and she was kind of big boned and disheveled and had a lot going on. And I said, ma'am, my mom would slap me. Now everybody at gate 34 at American Airlines is watching this. I didn't know who she was. I said, ma'am, my mom raised me better than this. She would slap me if she knew that you as a woman are coming up to me and I didn't give up my seat. I said, here, you can sit down. And as God is my witness, I was sitting next to a white guy. He was about 65. I didn't even say hi to him. I didn't know who he was. Soon as I offered him my seat, he stood up. <coughs> he took off. Now, I don't know if he had to use the restroom, if he had to make a call. He needed Dunkin' Donuts. He may have had race relation issue. I don't know. But he left. And she said, thank you, sweetheart. He left. You can have your seat. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So I got my seat right back. You can't outgive God. I got it right back. And the Lord said, just let her talk. I didn't tell her I was on staff at the time with Billy Graham. I didn't tell her I'm a preacher. If you have to tell someone who you are, you're probably not doing your job. And I don't get impressed with titles, but God gets impressed with testimony. We overcame them by the blood of the lamb and the word of our title. No, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. It's not about being a doctor or a PhD or a preacher or a pastor or the vice president of a country. No, if you're a child of God, that's the only title you need. And even you didn't earn it. Can I get an amen? Now, I may not be invited back, but it was a lot of fun with you today. <laughs> Watch this. I'm laying in a plane, but this is worth it. The Lord said, let her talk. Preachers like to talk. The Lord said, okay, plus I'm tired. 15 minutes she's talking and I'm just listening. And the old expression, he gave me two of these and one of these, but I'm still looking for a way in. Just like the Air Force with 200 million homes, look for a way in when everyone else is trying to walk out. She's talking and then she mentions Chuck Colson. And I remember the Lord whispered, how could she know Chuck Colson? We got an African-American who's telling me about a white Chuck Colson who's dead, but was chief of staff to a white Republican named Richard Nixon. But he got arrested for Watergate and Chuck Colson went to prison, but he got saved in prison and started the greatest prison ministry since the apostle Paul himself called Prison Fellowship. He got saved and before he died, I was invited to Chuck Colson's 75th birthday party and I got a picture with him. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. And yes, he was at the White House, but it wasn't until he went to the big house till his life finally made sense. And you know, the crazy thing is she goes, I just did 22 years in prison and I got saved in prison. 
And I looked at her and everybody at American Airlines is looking at our conversation and all I said was praise the Lord. First words I said other than you can have my seat in 22 minutes. And she looked at me and I looked at her and right then we both knew we were brothers and sisters in Christ. We slapped five and as God is my witness, my hair is back up like Don King. We had church in Charlotte at that gate in American Airlines. It wasn't black versus white, Republican, Democrat, male and female. We were brothers, kids of the king at that moment. And the crazy thing is I said, so praise the Lord, you just got out of prison. She goes, praise the Lord, I just got out of prison. I said, so you're on this flight with me to Washington. I said, where were you coming from? She said, I had dinner last night in Beverly Hills, California. I said, hold on. I said, I got friends who've lived in America their whole life, never did a day in prison. They've never been to California, much less Rodeo Drive. You had dinner last night in Beverly Hills? She goes, I sure did. I had dinner last night with Kim Kardashian and Kanye West in their house. And I looked at her and I'm like, Arnold from Different Strokes, what you talking about, Willis? She looked at me, she said, I'm the woman, Alice Marie Johnson, that Kim Kardashian flew to Washington, went to the Oval Office, and got me out of prison. And then so we flew in there, we took a picture, and I just spoke life into her, I gave her my card. She starts calling me, like, on a regular basis. The next month, and I'm not going to get political, because I just try to pray for both. Pray for Obama, pray for Trump, we all need prayer. Pray for me. The crazy thing is, I'm watching the State of the Union, and they talk about prison reform and he points to her in the balcony. My wife is like, that's the lady who gave up your seat. Next thing I know, the president of the United States is bragging on Alice Marie Johnson. She calls me the next day. I'm getting on a train in March and Paul, I'm going by myself from Union Station to New York to preach at an all African American church in Brooklyn, New York. And I look and my phone says, Alice Marie Johnson. And I answered and I said, how are you doing, sweetheart? She goes, Frank, I woke up thinking about you this morning. I said, Alice, I've been married. I'm off the... <laughs> she started laughing. She said, no, no, no. She said, the Holy Spirit woke me up at four o'clock this morning thinking about you. I said, what? God is my witness. She said, you gave up your seat when you didn't even know who I was in Charlotte. And I have a book that's coming out by Harper's Collins. They think it's going to be a bestseller. Kim's writing the foreword but would you also endorse the book that will be in every bookstore in America about my life? It's called Afterlife. She was to do a life sentence in prison, but she said she got pardoned by the president, but more importantly, I was pardoned by the Prince of Peace. And will you endorse my book when everyone reads it? And here's the thing, Alice got a pardon. This woman in the Bible got a pardon. I got a pardon in 1979, seven years old at a vacation Bible school, at a church running less than this. I walked the aisle and I remember saying to the pastor, is it too late for me? He said, what do you mean? I said, I've heard the gospel at seven. Is it too late for me? I've never gotten over Jesus. Frank, why would you preach to 150,000? Is it arrogant? No. You heard that old song, I was country, when country was a cool. There's a lot of people who want to be on TV. Not everyone will preach with the Taliban on the rooftops with guns at you. That's been my life. He died for me. I was going to live for him. And I'm just trying to tell one more. It's not too late. The religious said time had expired. But Jesus said, I'm going to make up time. Heavenly Father, we need you today. We thank you for Jesus. And thank you that you drop rocks. But the Bible says, if the righteous or people will not sing, the rocks themselves will cry out and worship God. Some have said, you're as dumb as a box of rocks. Oh God, how wrong they were. Because rocks are smarter than Harvard grads if you sing your praises. Help us be like the praise team today, that rock for the rock. But when we're out in the real world, help us not throw rocks, but drop rocks and act like the rock, strong, but full of grace. In Jesus' name.
with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask that everyone stand to their feet all over the auditorium. And I'm just going to ask with heads bowed and eyes closed, just stand with the last 30 seconds. Draw an imaginary circle around yourself. And if you're here today and you know you're saved with no one looking, would you just raise your hand towards heaven at the count of three? Heads bowed and eyes closed, but I'm saved. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you know that you know. Praise God. Praise God. Question number two. Will not embarrass anyone. No one's looking. But this is where it's at. You know, the football stadiums are being empty like never before, but the churches of God, I pray, will be full like never before. More than ever, we need Jesus. If you're here today and say, Frank, I'm saved, but the fact is there was a time I was a little closer to Christ than I have lately. But after today's message, and I see how pure he is, I have some house cleaning. Pray for me. I want to be a little bit more like Jesus this week with no one looking. If that's you, praise God for being honest. But if that's you, I'm saved, but I want to be more like Jesus this week. Would you raise your hand? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Question three. If you're here today and you've got one friend who has the weight of the world on them, they got questions, they've given up in life, they got bad news, their marriage is on the rocks, they're looking at more days than dollars, the unemployment doesn't even help, and the weight of the world is on them. If you know someone struggling today, would you just raise your hand for another friend? You know someone who needs a touch from God. Praise the Lord. If you're here today and you know one friend who's lost, I'm going to ask in just a moment, would you pray for them? Someone cared to pray for you. I want you to return the favor. But lastly, if you're here under the sound of my voice or you're watching by way of online today, today's for you. No judgment, just Jesus. If you're here today and say, Frank, I'm not sure if I leave here today. By the time my head hits the pillow tonight, if I was never to wake up ever again, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. If you're not sure but you'd like to know, just whisper this in your heart and Jesus will save you today. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. I have been caught red-handed. I'm not perfect. I dropped the ball. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. My past haunts me at times. Oh God, but I'm now toe to toe with you. And I'm not trying to impress you, not trying to fool you, not trying to get over you. I'm stuck, caught in the act, and I need you. I need grace. Forgive my soul. Take me to heaven when I die. I want to repent from my past. And I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, thank you for taking me to heaven. With no one looking, if you prayed that prayer a minute or for rededication, would you just raise your hand and say, Frank, I ask Jesus to touch me again today. Praise the Lord. Father, have your way this week. And when Satan brings up the past, help us bring up his future. Because Satan will burn in hell. But because of grace... I'll live forever in a mansion in heaven. Not because I'm so good, but because I met Jesus and he's so God. Amen. Can we give Jesus the loudest applause of the morning? Amen. <laughs>